Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on the 55th anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act. Um, I think it's appropriate that we are talking about engaging Black voters whose right to vote has been under constant attack um, for generations. Um, I'm really excited about the panel that we have today. Uh, Justin Myers, CEO of For Our Future Fund and For Our Future, Terrence Woodbury of Hit Strategies, and hopefully in a few moments, Latasha Brown, the Executive Director of Black Voters Matter, will also be joining us. Um, I normally start these off by asking folks, uh, by sort of reading um, bios and, and, and acquainting the audience with our, our panelists. But I thought today that we would try to have this as interactive as possible. And so I'm gonna remind everybody about the Q&A function, which you can use to ask questions at any time. And with that, I'm gonna kick it off by asking each of our panelists to talk a little bit about how they came to be doing the work that they're doing now and how their organizations are engaging Black voters um, ahead of November. And I'm going to start with Justin. Thank you, uh, Akuna. I'm so happy to be here to talk about uh, how we are engaging Black voters, especially on such an important day, um, the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. Um, you know, I got into politics um, mainly because of my father. Uh, my dad uh, is a Baptist minister, but also spent 30 years uh, as an employee of the Office of Housing in Philadelphia. Uh, so I, I saw him do a lot of amazing organizing uh, around our church, trying to, you know, help feed people that were in need. Uh, but also in his day job, I saw him also just help neighborhoods day in and day out, uh, whether it was helping them just find services so that they could have um, you know, adequate sewage, um, you know, in their street or making sure that the block was clean, being cleaned property, properly or even trying to help them set up a neighborhood watch um, during the 80s uh, when that was very much needed. Um, so it's, it's kind of led me to where I am today. You know, I, one of my first jobs out of college was a public school teacher in New York City uh, at a Title I school. Uh, and there I was, um, you know, it was just eye-opening to see the the trauma and the devastation that a lot of these black and brown kids were living through on a day in and day in and day out on a daily basis. Uh, and it was then that the spark started to develop that I needed to get involved to kind of figure out a way uh, to actually help address some of the underlying issues that stop a lot of these kids from thriving uh, in our school system. Um, and today I'm the CEO of For Our Future, uh, which, uh, you know, of course, is an organizing entity. Um, you know, our, our goal is to make sure that we are actually meeting people where they are, not coming in and out of communities as the election cycles come and go. We're actually permanently located in seven states, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, Virginia, and Nevada. Uh, and we've been in most of those states since 2016, talking to uh, black voters, of course, uh, about the issues that matter to them, uh, and then using those issues to actually organize, engage, get them to take actions, uh, and ultimately take that next step in our relationship, which is voting. Important uh, actually stay and continue to organize around the issues that are important to communities and lift those communities' voices up uh, in state capitals, in city halls, and right here in DC uh, when issues that come about that are important to them uh, are being discussed uh, and, and legislated. Thanks. Latasha, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, as always, it's a, it's a pleasure to see you, uh, sis. Um, so I want to, I, I, Justin just gave us a little bit of a background on uh, his organization and how he came into the work that he's doing. So I'm going to have Terrence do the same and then come back and then end with you. Um, so Terrence, just tell us a little bit about how you came to do the work that you're doing and what you're doing now at Hit Strategies to engage Black voters. Absolutely. So my name is Terrence Woodbury. I want to uh, thank Akuna and Third Way for having us here. Uh, you know, this is this is a, a critical day. Uh, we are um, rapidly approaching this election faster than I think makes any of us comfortable. <laughs> um, uh, and 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 you know, I think we all kind of feel the the responsibility and the burden um, of the of, of the anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. And in the shadow of, uh, of of saying goodbye to one of one of my heroes and one of our ancestors, who's fighting, who's 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 still kind of encouraging us along 
to, to keep getting in good trouble here. So I want to honor uh, John Lewis in this moment as well. You know, I started in politics early. I just had an early interest in politics as a, as a, as a kid. There was no one in my family in politics. I didn't really have a personal exposure. I was assigned the State of the Union in middle school, and then I never missed it again for the rest of my life. And, uh, and my parents kind of saw that passion early and they nurtured it. They, you know, made sure I was a page on Capitol Hill. I, was able to, I went to high school here in DC. So they gave me a proximity to politics and they made sure I paged on Capitol Hill. And when I started working in, in campaigns when I was at Morehouse, uh, we started volunteering for, you know, Barack Obama in 2008 and then local elections around Atlanta. And every election I ever worked on, I, I like the joke that I've worked every job in a campaign except for the candidate. And I have no intention of ever taking on that job. So, but, but in some of those jobs, I started to realize that everything was deferring to the data. Uh, as whether I was communications director or campaign manager or finance or field, everything kept referring back to what did the polls say. And I became more and more curious with who is the puppet master behind the curtain of the poll. Um, and, and when I finally peeked behind that curtain, I realized there was not a lot of people of color there. And that all of the decisions that are being made um, in these campaigns are being made, are being driven by data and not enough of us have our hands in that data. And so I, I pursued a, who I knew to be the only black pollster in the country at the time, uh, Cornell Belcher. And he, uh, I like to say, poached me from the Brookings Institution. I went and started working with him for about five years before starting his strategies. Um, and now we're just excited to be able to work with the three communities that we believe are on the, are on the front edge of changing electoral politics, millennials, minorities, and women. And we spend every day engaging and empowering those communities. That's excellent. Um, and finally, Latasha, um, again, it's always so good. I mean, we have this memo about colors today, so I'm, ha I'm happy to see you on this, <laughs> on this panel. But just talk to us a little bit about how you got into this work. Uh, of course, you are um, the executive director of, uh, and co-founder of Black Voters Matter. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you got into this work. And all we, so many of us know what Black Voters Matter is doing, but for our audience, just talk about what you're seeing and what you're doing uh, heading up into November. Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on. Hold on. I know you didn't ask me to sing, Akuna, but <laughs> I, in the I'm glad that Akuna, you did anyway. <laughs> I am a native of Selma, Alabama, and in the spirit of those who have literally laid the foundation around pushing for democracy and voting rights in this country, that's the shaping of who I am and the shaping of my work. And so in the spirit of and honoring the spirit of um, Representative John Lewis, but also Dr. C.T. Vivian, who was a mentor of mine. You know, I just want to take that the moment um, because we are right on the eve of the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. And so what brought me to this work? You know, I think there's two things. I think there's a shaping of who we are um, and how we express that in the world. What is it in terms of, of kind of the, our purpose in the world and how this led to Black Voters Matter. To make a, a long story short, I don't ever, there were two things that my entire life uh, even from a kid, I was always obsessed with this, this notion of who was in charge. I was a little kid and I would go into McDonald's. Um, it's a running joke in my family, actually, because I used to run my grandmother crazy. I would go in Kmart and I wanted to know who owned Kmart. Or I would go to Walmart and be like, well, who, who control, who owns the Walmart? She's like, baby, I don't know who owns Walmart. And, um, and I was always like acutely aware of to the point where I would go into places and I would always want to know, it was almost like a game around figure out who would be in charge. And I could always tell there was something about the those who were in charge that I could figure it out. And then the second thing is I always had a deep sense of injustice that I always, I was a little girl that would, 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 would challenge the bully, even though he probably could beat me up, but I talked so much stuff, I guess I would, I would <laughs> um, create the space um, around justice around that and how that led me to Black Voters Matter. I'm raising that because I think part of what led us to doing the work in Black Voters Matter, I've been a social justice activist for 25 plus years. And so 
what Cliff and I became increasingly frustrated. We had worked on all campaigns and almost kind of like what Terrence said, I've done everything in a campaign, including running for public office um, as a 20 something year old woman. Um, and my first race, you know, I experienced, um, even in that race, um, I experienced, that was the first time I became acutely aware of sexism as a young woman growing up in the deep South and growing up in the church where I wasn't allowed to speak in churches because they said I was a woman. I couldn't speak in the diocese in the church. Um, in addition to that, in that same election, uh, there was uh, seven days after they didn't call, they called the election and five minutes after they called the election, I got a phone call from the head of the Democratic Party saying that the sheriff had remembered five minutes after it had been confirmed, he had remembered that he had 800 votes that were placed up in a safe. And in my naivety, I thought that he would count those votes. And he was like, no, 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 it's already certified. He just remembered five minutes after it got certified. And so that was the first shaping of a, a direct experience around voter suppression. I raised that because I think all of these things that happen in our community, I'm not raising from the perspective of it happening to me. It is extremely common in our community in terms of how we're constantly disenfranchised, how we're constantly marginalized in different spaces. And so in 2016, what Cliff Albright and I um, in the founding of Black Voters Matter, we wanted to bring all of our experience and our skills as, as working as organizers. Both, if, both he and I had done policy work and had worked in the legislature. Both he and I had also done a lot of work, extensive work in philanthropy. And to bring that together and really be able to create an organization that could do a couple of things. That one, the conversation around Black folks ended at participation. That ultimately when we we're talking about voting, it was to the extent of participation. For us, the conversation was about power. So to the extent that participation leads to Black people getting power, that's what we were interested in. And we want to change the national discourse around that, that the work that we did was empowering communities. The second thing that when when I went to college, the first thing I learned in poli sci was all politics are local. So if that was the case, what we were seeing is we were seeing a lack of investment and Black people getting power on the local level. There were some resources in the national election. It would usually come late, three weeks out, I would always call it, here comes the round the Negroes up money, that there was no real investment in the community. There was real no empowerment strategy, only to the extent that Black voters could actually help secure other people in getting power. And so what we wanted to do is to create a different kind of framework that we were centering it on building power locally. We would build out with Black-led grassroots organizations. And so our work in Black Voters Matter, we decided that we would focus on three things. One, we wanted to move money to the ground, which is why we intentionally created the Black Voters Matter Fund. And in our second year of operation, our first, um, our first major campaign was around, we supported 32 organizations in the Black Belt region of Alabama. Um, and that was our first campaign. The second big campaign was in Georgia. And um, it was in Georgia and in 2018, we worked in seven states in the South. We moved almost a million dollars to 180 um, black led grassroots groups. The second thing that we knew, so we knew we needed resources, but we needed a strategic partner that many of the groups need a strategic partner to really be able to build out infrastructure. That ultimately we could not allow this just to be about turning out black folks in a campaign, that this had to be a power building strategy, that we had infrastructure, that infrastructure could do a number of things outside of election, which is why we say, and Black Voters Matter, that we do work 365 days out of the year. That the next day after the election, we're back at it. Because ultimately our goal is not just to, just, just to change the outcome of an election, but to build power for black folks unapologetically and so and then the third and the last thing is that it was really important for us that we were shifting the paradigm in which black voters were seen and how we see ourselves and so in our message black voters matter that was very intentional that there are people that care about black votes but don't care about black voters and so for us we want to center that these are people. We want to center what was important. In addition to that, we also wanted to make sure that we shifted the narrative around how black voters were perceived. That not just like we were this kind of offset vote that you that was just automatically gonna vote Democratic, um, but that fundamentally we had power. We had power to decide on DAs in our communities and congressional offices. And we, we even had the power to decide who would be the presidential nominee for the Democratic Party. And we wanted to own that, to stand in that, to and really be able to make sure that was part of the national um, discourse. Um, and the last and the final thing I said, I'll say is, because we work on voter suppression, there's so much I can say about our work. Um, 
We are activists. So we filed a lawsuit. We're in a lawsuit with the state of, Alabama, um, of Georgia right now and getting ready to file a lawsuit in both Mississippi and Alabama that we're fighting for the advocacy of Black folks. Um, but what's really important is that this process of voting can be a really traumatic experience. There's a lot already happening in our community. So integrated in all the work that we do is Black love and joy. And so we say the, 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 the foundation of our work is based on Black love and Black joy. And some of you may know we have the Blackest bus in America that we take around the country, really really anchoring that work and that message, but also really being able to connect with our partners and support them. Whew. You uh, you just blessed us from the singing to uh, all of that powerful um, information about the work that you're doing, Latasha. Um, you mentioned something about um, how traumatic voting can be. And I think that that's particularly, uh, like we're seeing that now, particularly with this pandemic. And I know that you were in Kentucky and actually also um, had COVID-19 after, you know, uh, organizing in Kentucky where we saw all of those, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad to see that you're that you're feeling much better um but justin i actually wanted to ask you you know normally at this time you know for our future would be out knocking on doors talking to folks but we're in the middle of a pandemic so how have you all adjusted the work that you're doing and how are you actually reaching voters and when you do reach them it's a two-part question how are you reaching voters and then when you do reach them what are you hearing about their level of engagement um, uh, in, in this upcoming election? Thank you for that question. You know, it's really interesting. We've had to be very nimble, flexible, and creative in terms of how we communicate. What I will say, though, is we built our model on relations, relational organizing and so that we build relationships with grassroots groups. That has been enormously helpful for us in this moment because what we're working is we're actually working through our partners who are in those communities, who are on the ground, who have their own constituency base. And so we're able to plug into them. It's not like we're just going door to door to random folks, just talking to them. We have, we're working with people who have authentic relationships with communities. And so what we've had to do is be really creative in expanding our digital footprint. And so what we've done is a number of things from virtual town halls. It's really interesting because in some ways the work has been harder, but in some ways we've been able to reach um, people a little bit more regularly in some of the communications. So for example, when we do town halls, we normally have about 100 people, maybe 100 to 200 people. In our virtual town halls, we've had from 300 to 1,000 people um, in each of the states to attend that. So in some ways it's actually helped us in reach um, nothing beats face to face because we're on the ground organizers. So I don't think anything beats that. But what we've had to do is really layer our work. So one, we've expanded our digital program, which was to, to augment the field work, but to do, a, 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 do our digital program. Secondly, to really be able to train the groups that we're working in on how do you do absentee ballot voting and how do you do the absentee ballot and mail-in voting to really even start thinking about the culture because in the culture in black communities, I know even my grandmother, when I would go vote with my grandmother, she would dress up. She would, we would have to put on our Sunday's best to go vote. So there's a culture of voting in our community that we can't just overlook. And so in leading into that, we also have to take community and literally through a process that we're actually helping them to make the adjustment. And we have to make the adjustment in that. We've been doing massive text messages campaign. So we are actually, matter of fact, we had two elections this week that we reached out to millions of folks, um, about two million Black people that we used the text message campaign, but you can't stop there. You have to keep layering it. One, you have to use your re relationship capital. You have to also create these other spaces in the digital space. Um, and we're also doing some other pieces that are actually create some safety. We're doing a training um, on mobilizing and organizing in the in COVID-19. We actually had Dr. COVID, um, Dr. Kamara Jones, who is a well-renowned, I call her our Black Dr. Fulci. You know, we wanted to bring people to the conversation who literally had a race analysis, but they could also tell us the danger and what was happening. We've had her and done a couple of trainings um, and virtual town hall discussions specifically around the health risk. And we're talking about how do we create a model that people don't have the false choice of, we've got to go and vote, or make ourselves um, susceptible of catching, the, catching the, the virus. I can say from personal experience, as you said, Akuna, I can say from personal experience, I had not gone anywhere. I have been in my home, which is really, really, really new for me. And we went to Kentucky because in Kentucky, which people may or may not know, that the it was such, a, uh, such an egregious um, issue that in, in Jefferson County, 
which the majority of black folks, over 50% of black folks in the entire state of Kentucky live in this one county, that in this county that normally had 370 polling sites, they were all reduced to one polling site. This is to serve 612,000 people. And so we were called on our partners to come there. We went there. Unfortunately, as safe as, as, safe as I was, as distanced as I remained, I caught COVID-19 myself. And so I'm raising that, that we actually have to take it serious, how it's been devastating in our community. That in addition to our voter work, the, the, the last thing I'll say that's kind of related to this is that it's hard to talk to folks. If we're, we, it's disingenuous to talk to people just about voting right now and step over what they're going through. And so we recognize that. And so what we did is we actually created what was called the Saving Ourselves Fund. We put $350,000 on a fund that actually are many of the groups that are on the ground that are leading some of the rapid response work that we're and mutual aid groups, we've been giving resources to them. That part of this process of empowering is actually engaging people. If you show up when people need you, when you show up when there's needed, then, then we're transitioning in terms of the vote. Part of why black folks are disengaged in the process is because they feel exploited. They feel used, they feel taken for granted. But when you show up in a way that when they need you, then it's a different kind of relationship. And so because of that, we've been able to identify other new partners in this process as well. And so we've got a number of things that we've been doing this week. People have been caravanning, like going in communities, instead of going canvassing door to door, we've been doing caravan, 50 car caravans, where we're going in communities, creating the excitement, but also creating the distance. And then we layer it with text messages, we layer it with mailers, we lay it with radio ads. And so we have had to be creative in terms of how we're being in touch with folks, but the basic fundamentals of organizing remain the same. Do you have an authentic relationship with people? Do you have an authentic and powerful message with folks? And do you have a, a, a action, a set of actions that you're actually telling them to do that are reasonable and feasible that they will actually, in, you can enfold them in. And that's what we've been using as our strategy. We've had a couple elections um, since that time, uh, the worst, and I'll, I'll just say this real quickly, the worst election, in my entire 49 years of life is what I experienced in Georgia. In Georgia, you know, it took me three hours to vote, which was, was you know, what was a, a headache all in itself. But then when I go to the north side of town, which is the majority white districts, here it is. I didn't even know it was a voting site because nobody was out waiting. People were strolling in and strolling out. We got other phone calls, the same thing. Sometimes I came back to on the black side of town at um, Adams Park District, Folks had been waiting and it was 1 p.m. People had been waiting in line for five, six hours that the machines did not come online till 12 o'clock. In addition to that, what in, a, in addition to that, what we also saw is um, what we in, in addition to that, what we also saw was that when we got people engaged in the process that when we talked to folks around there they said they had been waiting for hours and nobody had communicated with them and so that was a really really bad example but to add insult to injury later that evening when we're talking to people what we realized is that um, later that evening at seven o'clock we get a phone call there were hundreds of people still in line um at seven o'clock and so fulton county extended it to 9 p.m 9 p.m. they extended. I had to do something. Um, I had to do a, uh, a national interview on, um, I had to do a Lawrence O'Donnell show, which ends at 1030. If you watch that show, I'm headed to bed. I get a phone call at 10, after 1030 that there were hundreds of black voters still in line in Union City, Georgia. My team and I went out where there were other organizations we stayed out there. When we get there, there's a line wrapped around the building. We stayed out there to the last voter voted at 12.37 a.m. on Wednesday. So why is it that Black people, it takes us till Wednesday to vote, where our white counterparts, and they have to stand in line for hours and hours. There is something going wrong, and we're actually stepping over it. But there's a major targeted disenfranchisement of Black voters that we have to take serious. We just can't do business as usual, because that's not what we're seeing on the ground. We are seeing an intensified effort to marginalize and disenfranchise Black voters. So, so Justin, I know that you're also doing quite a, typically for our futures also at the doors. And so just touch a little bit about how you're pivoting. And then if you would talk a little bit about some of the issues that you are hearing coming up with the voters that you're interacting with. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And, you know, I think most uh, field organizations were definitely caught off uh, guard by COVID. 
I would like to say, you know, we're a little bit different than that, that we always thought of ourselves as an organizing entity. Uh, and anyone that is an organizer knows that there are, there's one really crucial, important element to organizing, which is having a two-way conversation with an individual to try to tease out what matters to he or she in their community, right? And you want to make sure that that conversation continues throughout the course of the cycle. To Latasha's point, we don't want to come to voters last minute and say, are you voting for uh, candidate X or candidate Z? For, for our future, when we go to a door, the first question that we actually ask is, what issue matters to you in your community? What issue do you want to see addressed uh, in, in City Hall, in your state capital, or in DC? Uh, and right now, you know, we've been able to transition to 100% virtual work, uh, where we are actually organizing in the virtual space. We're, we're doing town halls, to Latasha's point. Um, you know, we've had teletown halls in Pennsylvania, uh, in Michigan, in Nevada, uh, with elected officials uh, around uh, the ACA and how Trump is trying to dismantle it, particularly at a time when so many people are losing their health care. Uh, so making sure that we are truly grounded in teasing out those issues when we speak to folks is what makes us successful. And since, you know, March 13th, when we ceased uh, on the ground organizing, we've actually reached out to more than 3 million voters. Well, the organizing hasn't stopped. Uh, we, we've uh, also teased out more than 27,000 issue responses from those voters. Uh, and when we're talking about organizing, we're still organizing. We're organizing in the virtual space. Our folks in Michigan, while when they have their, 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 uh, their, their block parties uh, where they go and organize uh, with activists on a particular block, They've simply moved those to the virtual space and now we're doing them, they're doing them via Zoom. Uh, our relational voters um, uh, that help us with relational voting, excuse me, uh, in Wisconsin. Um, and those trainings that used to happen in person are now happening in the virtual space. We're still training people on how to do digital organizing to make sure that when they're texting, when they're you know, in Facebook Messenger talking to a voter, when they're making a phone call, uh, whatever it is, we want to make sure that we're equipping them with with the ability to actually continue to organize by teasing out the issues that matter to their friends, family, neighbors, and colleagues. And what we're hearing is important. I can tell you in 2018 and 2019, you know, Black voters were talking about a lot of different issues. If you look uh, at, at, at just Black voters writ large, they were talking about gun violence prevention. They were talking about more school funding. They were talking about, of course, dislike of Trump. Uh, if you dig down into states, a place like Michigan, Black voters are talking about clean water. In Detroit, they're talking about auto insurance because it's so high on Detroit, double the national premium. Um, you know, in, in a place like Pennsylvania, African Americans are talking about opioid abuse and local blight. So you can see, of course, we are not a monolith. There are many things that drive us to vote. And if politicians are smart, they will take the time to actually listen, which is what we need more of them to do so that they can speak to the issues that actually move Black voters. What I will say now, since COVID, where we saw that there were a number of different issues uh, when speaking to black voters across our seven states, it's, it's somewhat, it's very much different now. Uh, for the most part, you know, it falls into two boxes. Um, you know, we have uh, the, the economic impact of COVID, which is by far and large, the major concern of African Americans across seven states, uh, losing income, um, you know, uh, uh, losing your retirement, and things of that nature. Uh, and they're also concerned about school closures. So very much so, that's our, our second big bucket, where folks are really worried about social distance learning, whether or not schools are gonna be open. Uh, the balance between how they're actually going to work while still providing uh, adequate education for their child is what we're hearing. It's very interesting to see how, how, how these issues have kind of coalesced uh, into smaller buckets versus what we were talking about in 2018 and 2019, where of course, African-American voters in Michigan were thinking about very different things from African-American voters in, in Florida. But right now, um, folks are very much focused on the economic impact of COVID. They're very much focused on school closures. And then that third bucket is Black Lives Matter, uh, which of course is, is, is something that Black voters are talking about. And you can see that in every age demographic uh, that we're speaking to. Thank you. So, so Terrence, yeah, so I was going to, I was going to ask you, Terrence, as the pollster, what are, what are Democrats missing? Like, what are we not talking about? What dynamics are we not talking about and paying attention to that we really need to be, right? Uh, you know, before we got on, we, we talked a little bit about Kanye West, but are, are there other, are there other things that, 
you know, strategists and others who, who have access to the media all the time are, 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 are missing that we're not talking about that we really need to, to focus on, particularly when it comes to black voters. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm careful not to, uh, not to oversimplify, but it's really quite simple. Uh, Democrats are missing racism. Democrats' response to racism is, is, uh, is, is accessible health care. Democrats' response to racism is better jobs. Democrats' response to racism is, is higher wages. They are completely missing it. Republicans, led by Donald Trump, have waged a culture war in this country. And, and our response to it cannot be an, cannot be an economic response. And, and, and across the board, no matter what demographic of, of uh, a group of Black people I'm talking to, no matter what geography of Black people I'm talking to, the number one issue for African-American voters is racism by 20 points. Nothing even close. And the reason, and this is how much we're missing at Akuna, and this is why representation and data matters. This is why representation and who is doing your research matters because the reason we're missing it is because quite literally they don't even ask the question hmm. most pollsters ask an issue battery racism is not even on the list they're asking health care they're asking jobs they're asking crime they're asking gun violence they're asking climate they don't even ask about it and so when i when i join these tables and i say the single biggest issue to black voters today is racism, I'm introducing what seems to be a foreign concept in, 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 in a room of allies, in a room of people who are progressive and like-minded and want to help address the, the, the most important issues to black voters, but, but I'm missing it. And, is, and, is, and this is, this is, this is uh, demonstrating itself in a couple of ways. You know, we, we conduct a monthly poll called the Black Track. It's a national poll of black voters, a thousand black voters, uh, we ask the same questions every month because, you know, far too often we kind of get these snapshots and I'm much more interested in the trend line. I'm much more interested in how voters are not just responding to this question, but how they're responding over time. And, and we've been asking this question about, uh, about uh, the importance of the next president to, uh, to improve race relations. And 92% of black voters believe it is very important, not just important very important and intensity matters in these polls. 92% of black voters believe it is very important for the next president to improve race relations. Only 48% of those black voters believe that Joe Biden will actually do so. Mm. We're missing it. And as long as Trump is defining racism as a partisan issue, then Democrats have an opportunity to not only mobilize black voters around what is the most important issue to them, but to also mobilize what we have seen is a growing coalition of Black Lives Matter. We've all seen that these protests, the complexion of these protests are changing. And it's what I have observed as, as, an, as an evolution of, of, of the Black Lives Matter movement being a movement of black people versus police to it now being a movement of young people versus racism. And that's what we see in these protests is a, is, a, is a much younger demographic, a much more diverse demographic. And while they are still protesting about black issues, it's not just black people protesting about it. And, 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 and Democrats have an opportunity to, uh, to, 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 to speak an affirmative and, and, um, and, uh, and a, a different vision of race in America, where, where, the, where, where, it's, where race, is it where diversity is a part of our strength and where we can actually start to coalesce not just the black vote, but the young vote. And we know that young people are now the, uh, the biggest voting bloc in America. Only 60% of young people are voting for Democrats right now. Sometimes 68, depending on where you are, we might get as high as 70, 72. That means that there are 30% of young people under the age of 30 who, sh who are aligned with us on this issue who disagree with Republicans and how they're defining race in this country and who we have an opportunity to, to activate if we lean into race in, a, in an affirmational way.
You know, I I, I do want to, and I agree with I, I agree with Terrence, but I do want to lean into because I want us to have in order for us to really move forward, we've got to be honest around this conversation. Because I would say, and and uh, and and there's a part that we have to also speak about the racism within the Democratic Party. That part of what how the Democrat this is not an issue just about race. They know about racism. They've been long here long enough that they know about racism. This is about power. Racism actually maintains the the inequities of the power structure. It may maintains the status quo. And so racism has been a tool to lock out black people and other people of color in the process. So it serves as a tool to protect their power. And so ultimately when we're saying that we also have to hold them accountable because when I go back to, I'm gonna go back to the Kentucky, um, the Kentucky example that I laid. The mm -hmm. Kentucky example, the governor of Kentucky is a Democrat. The, Repu the secretary of state is Republican. The plan to close all 370 si um, polling sites in the large, in the, the county that had the majority of black folks in the entire state that went to one polling site for 612,000 voters, I need that to sink in. That was decided upon by a Democrat and a Republican. Primarily, some people believe it's because there was a there's a white candidate who that the white Democrats felt were more electable than this black underdog candidate that came in the race. So let's so I, I'm raising this because there's a fundamental issue around structural racism that is embedded in the very fiber of this country that maintains the white status quo in both of the parties, the Republican and the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party in many ways because of their own their own power dynamic, they know that the base, the most consistent base has been African-American voters. But when you look at the investment in terms of where the investment has been made, it has not been around on a black vote. I can go back to the, the last three weeks in terms of investing resources. Part of my organization existed. We created it to disrupt that. So we created that not around just the Democratic Party, but who was making sure that we were literally looking out for building the power of black folks and literally leveraging about black folks and that we're not just reduced to participation, but that we want power like everybody else because we want our, cha our lives changed and the conditions improved. So I raise that because I think there has to be a fundamental question, even within the context of the Democratic Party. Matter of fact, even more so because the Republicans have told us, Lisa, they honest enough to tell us and just stand in their, in, in their racism. But there is this intrinsic, when you look at their 6.6 black, 6.6 um, a percent of black folks, when you look in the, uh, in the country, black women, less than 3% of those are black women in serving in office. When you look at who the Democratic Party supports for constitutional offices and legislative offices, I'm raising this not as to badge or to talk down about the Democratic Party. I'm raising this because fundamentally, if this conversation isn't about power, we're going to be reduced to just as participating in a system to help these political parties get power. We've got to shift that paradigm and the center of that conversation has to be about us and leveraging our participation in a way that it does lead to policy changes, that it does lead to the, the, eco, the addressing the economic disparities that our community is going through. Even right now, when we're talking about COVID-19, our community is devastated about what is happening in COVID-19. More so, we can go from the health issue, we can go to the economic issue, we can go to the small business issues. Where is the policy to the base of voters who have been the most consistent for the Democratic Party, where's the policy to address that? So I don't need you, I, I don't need folks to have a kumbaya moment about whether they believe racism is real or not. What I do need is I need you to respect the power of black folks to participate and to hold this party up and turn that into some real policy outcomes that would advance our community. That's what we've got to demand and shift the conversation and really shift the national discourse. And one more thing, Akuna, and I'll be brief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Uh, Parents and Lashana have brought up, Latasha has brought up great points. Um, you know, I think what we're hearing from our voters when we speak to them is the remnants of structural racism. When people talk about more school funding, when people talk about police brutality, I'm looking at Wisconsin right now. The top five issues amongst Black voters in Wisconsin are racism, Black Lives Matter, police brutality, COVID economic impact, and job and income loss. In 2019, when the top issues was mass incarceration, all of this is under the umbrella of institutional racism, right? It's all structural racism that has affected many different systems that Black people uh, are, are the victims of, whether it's inadequacies in schools, inadequacies in many of our infrastructures within our cities, uh, the fact that when, when America uh, has the cold, we have the flu, look at COVID and what it's doing to the Black community. 
it's all part of structural racism. And I strongly believe that when we're speaking to African Americans, they are telling us that inequalities exist at many different levels of their lives because of the structural racism uh, that we have in this country. Yeah, I, I do want to, um, we, we, we touched a little bit about it uh, on it, but Terrence, I do want to just talk a little bit about Kanye West and, and the effort that we are now seeing by Republican operatives to make sure that he gets on ballots in, in some of the key states. Um, you know, you've talked a little bit about the fact that we can't ignore it and there's a question um, in, in the audience about it. So just talk a little bit about what you're seeing and what we need to be, what we need to be focused on and and, and how how salient, um, salient his candidacy should be. Absolutely. So, you know, any third party challenger represents a tremendous threat to, to Joe Biden um, because the level of enthusiasm around his candidacy is not very high amongst a couple of, of, of key demographics. Uh, and we, and you know, one of those demographics being young people, one of those demographics being uh, younger black people. And in fact, the Harvard IOP recently did a poll in which they asked the horse race, Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. And Joe Biden uh, was ahead 23 points. But when they asked Joe Biden versus Donald Trump versus third party candidate, Joe Biden was only ahead by 14 points. That 10 point drop is the margin of difference. If, if, if Joe Biden loses eight to 10 points um, to a third party candidate, then, then it changes the outcome of this election. And that is what is so important about Kanye West is that Kanye West doesn't have to get millions of votes. And this is one thing that we all understand anecdotally talking to our informed and engaged black friends is that they're not taking Kanye West serious, but we are not Kanye West's target. And, and Kanye West's message that Democrats and Republicans have taken black people for granted, his message that we have been herded uh, behind one political party despite what is in our best interest. That is a message that is being repeated by voters around the country. In fact, half of black voters believe that Democrats take their vote for granted. More concerningly, 60% of black men believe that Democrats have taken their votes for granted. Um, and so Kanye West, you know, so appearing on a, on a ballot in a state like Michigan, where Donald Trump won by 11,000 votes, you know, Kanye West can release anything right now, today, and sell more than 11,000 uh, copies, products of it in, in Michigan. Anything, any ticket, any shoe, any t-shirt, he's selling more than 11,000 copies of it. And so that is the thing that we have to be very, very careful of, is that um, if, if Kanye West can successfully get on the ballot, and I don't think that he has the infrastructure to by himself, it will take some very savvy, political operatives to get Kanye, on the, Kanye West on the ballot this late. That takes organizing, that takes petitions in some places. Uh, he just does not have that type of infrastructure. So he is being helped. Um, it is, you know, the media is beginning to report that he's being helped by Republicans, but we have to be very, very, very careful of the threat that Kanye West, could be, that Kanye West creates because he could easily change the outcome of this election. By and, West. and there's two issues that he speaks to that, that that scared me to death. If you, you know, when they asked him, why is he supporting Donald Trump? He said, well, Donald Trump is great on real estate, right? Like he's talking about building wealth. The second thing that he's gonna talk about, of course, is also criminal justice reform, which in Wisconsin last year, mass incarceration was a top five issue amongst African-Americans. We know uh, in Wisconsin, the, the incarceration rates among African-Americans are through the roof, right? So simultaneously, you have Donald Trump running ads to African-Americans in Milwaukee about how he's good on, on, on uh, criminal justice reform, passing out pamphlets at, at supermarkets talking about how he's good on criminal justice reform. Kanye can come in and really appeal to black men, young black men in particular, who are fed up with the criminal justice system and fed up with their inability to provide for their family. And he can capitalize off of it and, and in, in the process, make a candidate like Joe Biden lose in a state like Wisconsin, where we lost by just, what, 22,000 votes in 2014, 2016, excuse me. I know we're okay, running. I know. Quickly to this, because sure. one, I do think, I, I, I hear, I have a slightly different analysis, but I'll just say this, that, and when I look at Detroit, that the, uh, the, 
I think we should be concerned about the Kanye's and whatever, but we, what we really need to be concerned about is voter suppression. And because, and what we also, if I go back to Michigan, in Michigan where Trump won by 10,000, less than 10,800 votes, there were 70,000 votes that were kicked out that were not counted in Detroit alone. The way they are taking this election, my point in saying this is because we have to be focused and diligent because what will happen is part of what Trump has been good at is being a distraction, to create a distraction and then we divert resources in other ways instead of fighting where we know that we have the numbers that ultimately that there is there are going to be other threats there are going to be people right but I also remember being in conversations with folks that was swearing me down that Bloomberg was gonna win I was on the ground I kept telling them he ain't gonna win not only did I know he wasn't gonna win but those of us who had been doing work were, were, were insistent upon on what we were saying and what we we're seeing but folks kept saying he was gonna win not only did he not win he didn't place right and he had to drop out I'm saying so it, and you have to actually have a pulse of what is happening with people. People know, Black folks right now know the critical nature of what is happening. And while there will be some to go with Kanye, there's a whole bunch of people that can be tapped into if we're investing, if we're creating the message, and if we are fighting against voter suppression, that's where we should put the bulk of our efforts and not get distracted by what the media puts to make someone seem like they're, they're the biggest threat. The more that we give life to that, the more that that grows, when in fact, we've got the numbers on our side. The numbers are on our side. We've got to cultivate and harvest those numbers. I'm glad you raised voter, voter suppression because I wanted to talk about this. So there's an Emerson poll showing that Trump leads among folks who are saying they're going to vote in person by 65 to 32, where Biden leads with folks saying they're going to vote by mail 76 to 20. And so if we see what's happening with the U.S. Postal Service, and we know that the game for Republicans is to cheat whether it includes putting Kanye on the on the on the ballot, knowing he's not going to win, whether it includes disappearing thousands and thousands of votes, closing down polling stations, and so um, definitely polling um, voter suppression is going to be a key tactic. And I do believe that Black voters are going to show up. But what I what I want, because I know we're we're short on time, and I know that um, that's how she, you've got to. So I want the three of you to just talk a little bit about the the one or two key things that you feel like Democrats need to ensure that they are focusing on when it comes to the diversity of Black voters, whether it's policies or tactics or process to ensure that we come out and that our votes are counted. Um, and I'll start with you, Latasha. You know, I'm going to say something that some find controversial, but I, the, the, we can start with, with Biden picking a Black woman as VP. Um, and part of why we're saying that is not just out of out of, of, of the optics around it, but fundamentally based on just particularly what Terrence has said, that there is a appetite in this country right now to see to move beyond some of the racial strife that want people want to see something different. When we see where the energy has come from, when we know that Black women voters have been voting, have been carrying the, the, the Democratic Party on our back for the last 50 years, in addition to we raised that campaign from the dead in South Carolina. So let I'm saying that because I think that we have to really be clear about um, uh, that we want power, that this is a new ball game that we're actually for power. So that's one. The second, I am deeply, I keep talking about voter suppression because I literally think that that is the biggest issue being to disenfranchise us. The entire voting rights movement was based on disenfranchisement of black voters. We are seeing it at massive scale right now. And literally there are Republicans that are using COVID-19 as an excuse. Um, to really be able to steal this election. What I am not seeing from the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party should be having a, a very robust program right now to combat voter suppression. There, there should be press conferences, in my opinion, every day. That's where the votes are being stolen. In some ways, I think we're so distracted, right, and getting caught up in all of these distractions that, that Trump um, is doing, that we're not really focusing on where the leak is. Like when you're a good organizer, you look at where the, the pain is coming from. And so I think it's really important for us to support right now. To me, to, to be honest with you, who I see who's on the forefront of supporting, educating folks are grassroots groups like Justin's group, my group, and other groups. We're literally doing work that the Democratic Party should be doing, but they're not doing, just to be honest. That there needs to be investment in Black-led groups that have infrastructure that are intermediaries right now that are doing the work, even NAACP, LDF, and the Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights, those groups that are advocating are watchdog groups and are empowering organizations to deal with voter suppression. That's where we should be making a lot of our investment right now. 
Thank you. Justin? Uh, I would say the first one is issues. Uh, we got to speak to the right issues. And if, if our presidential candidate won't do it, we need to, to Latasha's point, we need desperately for community organizations like ours to be on the ground speaking to these issues and showing folks that there is hope, there is chance, we can have a voice here, not only with this president, but just with government writ large, right? Like making sure that they are, that we are taking the time to listen to people, hear what their issues are, coming back and connecting those issues to our candidate, and then letting folks know that in these organizations, you have a partner, you have an advocate that is going to walk with you, lock and step, and pushing Democrat or Republican on the issues that matter to these communities. That's hugely important. And I think that we have the ability to create the enthusiasm with certain demographic groups, i.e. young African-American men, that maybe our candidate doesn't have the ability to do. But organizations like Block, Black Leaders Organizing Community um, in, in Milwaukee, organizations like Power, uh, there's a number of organizations that I can rattle off that have the ability to create that enthusiasm and the sense of urgency amongst certain demographic groups. The other piece that I think is hugely important, uh, again, to Latasha's point, the tactics that we are using have to be geared towards dealing with voter suppression. And for us, one of those tactics is going to be uh, relational voting. Um, you know, back in the day, we just called it, you know, your friends and family network, right? But we know that there are going to be a number of ways that they are going to try to suppress the vote, whether it's what they're doing to the United States Postal Service, whether it's Trump tweeting about, uh, you know, VBMs not being reliable, vote by mail not being reliable. Uh, whatever it is, we know that folks are going to try to make it harder for our folks to vote on top of maybe just getting rid of polling locations, early voting locations, uh, and then the fact that we're dealing with COVID. The, our ability to cut through all the disinformation will be heavily reliant upon friends, family, colleagues, talking to people about the importance of voting and voting safely, if you can, via VBM, making sure you are educating people, particularly older African Americans who we are seeing are a little bit hesitant to vote by mail, particularly in newer states like Pennsylvania and Michigan. We have to use tried and true tactics that allow for us to talk to our people about the importance of this election cycle. And I firmly believe that it will help us cut through all the BS that's going on at the White House, in our courts, and at the local level. And it will help us drive out the vote. Thank you. And just, um, sorry, Terrence. Yeah, so uh, I, I think I think those are very important points I want to echo. I do think that picking a Black VP is important. Um, I don't I don't know if that's controversial, but it shouldn't be for all of the reasons that I don't said. think it is. I don't think it is. <laughs> but I, but I wanna just, just to that point, you know, our, our research is showing that picking a black VP may not necessarily result in a lot more black people voting for Biden, but not picking a black VP will absolutely result in less black people voting for Biden. That's a part of that. He's taken us for granted. It will reaffirm that idea that 60% of black men already have, that, that Democrats take our votes for granted. And so, so I, I do think that's a, that's a big component. That's interesting. But the other, the other, the other thing, and this is the, the single most important to, to the point that both Natasha and Justin made, I believe that the single most important impact on this election will be who has access to the vote. Um, and, and you know, we're, we're releasing a, just a, a pretty big vote by mail project with HRC, NAACP, Unidos, and Latino Victory Fund that is releasing uh, today at 7.30. Shameless plug, please tune in. Follow us at HitStrat if you want more information about it, at HitStrat on, on Twitter. Um, uh, but, but we found some really interesting things there about, around vote by mail. It's a huge, uh, a robust research of just voters of color, 1,600 voters of color, uh, so it was big enough and robust enough for us to get up under the hood of some of these things. And what we found is that most people of color's reluctance to vote by now is just that they never have before. Mm -hmm. It's a visceral reluctance and not an intense reluctance. And if someone just had a conversation with them about it, about the process, literally just showing them images of a vote by mail ballot just makes it more familiar and more accessible. These are the kinds of things that Latasha is talking about. This requires an information campaign. This requires an investment in these communities to start telling them right now because they're hearing this shit from the president every single day. It's, it's fraud, it's not gonna work. And while they don't trust the messenger, they're beginning to repeat the message. Mm. 
And we got to cut through that thing. And, and it's going to require a deliberate and, and robust investment into the black community. And that cannot happen in the last three weeks. We have to start right now. And it has to have offensive messengers. So that's it. Thank you for that. Well, I just want to uh, thank the three of you for taking some time out today to help us commemorate this 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act and the signing signing of it. We know that our right to vote is under attack, and and in some, you know, with Tasha hearing the stories in Georgia, um, you know, sometimes I wonder if there's even been that much progress over the 55 years uh, since we got since the since the um, VRA was signed. Um, but we know we can't let up, and we know we've got to power on through November, and so. I I thank the three of you for taking the time out today. And I thank this audience for, uh, for joining us for this important discussion. Thank you.